Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. Manchester's Royal Exchange Theatre, with the theatre company Tamasha, is presenting a reworked version of Tanika Gupta's adaptation of Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, set during the Indian partition in Bengal, three decades after Dickens' death. The production is directed by Pooja Gai, Artistic Director of Tamasha, and I spoke to her at the Royal Exchange at the end of the third week of rehearsal. This is Dickens, but not quite as we know it. So what's the story of Tanika Gupta's adaptation? Um, so Tanika has uh, set it in Kolkata, um, and our timeline runs from 1899 to 1911, and it's set during the time of the partition of Bengal. And... I mean, Tanika's had the brilliant opportunity to kind of revisit because she did the adaptation in 2011 and there was a production that went out then. And in that production, she'd set it in um, Kolkata as well, but just transported the story, the characters, the characters' names to this Indian village um, and Havisham kind of represented the crumbling British Empire. So when we got the chance to do it again, Tanika was reading it and she was like, there is so much more I want to do with this. And actually... I want to write about the partition of Bengal, and it it fits so well to Dickens's story in the original. So, in all her brilliance and uh, you know her her colonial lens through her narrative and storytelling, we set it during that time. So, the first half of the play, Pipley is in his village by the river Padma in Rajshahi, and then he moves to Calcutta when he goes in for his great expectation journey, as it were. And at the time he hits Calcutta, this is when the partition of Bengal is beginning and when Lord Curzon is putting out this new tactic, which in today's terms we understand is the concept of divide and rule that the British imperial powers did so well and are still very good at, as we can see with our own government. So it seemed to be a really... um, a really relevant, relevant, is that what I mean? But it, it, like putting it through that lens was bringing up all the conversations we were having now. And so it kind of, it kind of opened up this whole other world. And when we started looking at the partition of Bengal and that time, we started looking at the farmers in the villages and the amount of opium. The opium trade was massive along the shores of India. And again, we don't really know that because in modern day terms, it gets redacted to China and Afghanistan. Um, But actually, all those farmers were growing that opium. The families were being deeply affected by it. And much like today, our 1% was making a lot of money out of the opium trade, as well as a lot of money out of India that was then going back to Britain. But it's another erasure of history. So it felt right that we integrated that storyline. So Habersham, as well as representing the crumbling British Empire and a kind of a metaphor for the East India Company, her father was in the opium trade. So the money was made out of the opium trade. Compasson and Arthur, her half-brother, were were draining, trying to drain the coffers of their father's money because of the money he made out of the opium trade. So all of these interconnecting links seem to work really well to reflect that history and, and kind of give us a clue as to why we are where we are today. It sounds like a lot of work has gone on to the, uh, gone into the script for the new production. Yeah. Uh, how, how much of those changes do you think are due to how society has, has changed its outlook and how, how much do you think due to how you and um, Tanika are a little bit older and looking at it in a different way? Absolutely. I think, I think it's, it's, you know, hindsight and reflection are great things, aren't yeah. they? Um, and for me, there were two things that came out of it. And it was a question I put to Tanika as a writer who has been in the sector for a long time. She's, you know, she's got a huge amount of plays that she's written and she's worked on stages across the country and across the world. So it was really interesting that 10 years ago, actually, the nuance and the depth and the bravery of that story in comparison to what we're writing now, the difference is great. And I think personally, speaking for myself, I kind of go, the sector wasn't, was just about ready for us to transpose Dickens 10 years ago and keep it very similar, a very similar reflection set in a different country with this kind of lens on it. It was a veneer, if you like. Yeah. 10 years on, I think, yeah, our conversations are much better in the sector. We still have so far to go and I'm, I'm kind of bored of saying that. It's better, but we've got so far to go. 
But the truth of it is there are a lot more of us now out there with a voice, with with a kind of, we've done enough work now to justify having a voice and fighting for our perspectives, I guess. That, and because there's more of us, more of the global majority on our stages, writing, leading theatres, leading companies, having a voice at the decision-making table, it means that the conversations become more nuanced because there's more people at the table with yeah. the lived experience. Mm. And for me, it's all about the integration and collaboration. And what Tanika does so well in all of her plays and all of the ones that I've had the pleasure to be a part of, let alone talking about South Asian history and giving a lens to our history. She always talks about our collective history as British and as Asians and about the fact that ultimately our allyship, our integration, our understanding of how we have all been in each other's lives for over 200 years is a vital part of all of this. We are not separate. We didn't come in the 1960s. Britain didn't just discover the South Asian subcontinent through our immigration into the island. Britain came to India, stayed, got its hooks in and took all the resources out and built its own country out of that money. So unless we understand that, it's really difficult to to really talk about our histories because we've got to we've got to unearth what imperial power has meant. I mean, we're doing it today in modern day life. We're in wars all over the world. We're looking at imperialism and nationalism and fascism in very different lenses, but they all come from somewhere. We, you know, the Holocaust is on our curriculum. We learn about it. It is really vital that we know our children learn about it. But there are there is a whole other history we just don't know about. We can't all put it on this one moment in time and Hitler's perspective on the world. No, it, it was happening way before that. Hmm. So I think that that's a balance of it that we kind of went, we can really kind of get into this now because we have a sector that's talking about it Um with less fear maybe but there's we're still we're still only at the first few layers if we dig even deeper then we're going to get we're going to get into issues of colorism and we're going to get into issues of kind of what what superiority what supremacy means and again this play has started to talk about it because the colorism between our communities again is a very entrenched attitude that has come out of this history And in Great Expectations, we have a cast that is of British heritage, that is of dual heritage, that is of African heritage, that is of South Asian heritage. So it is talking about the integration of all of these communities and the impact of what that power has meant. So I I was born in Kenya and um, my parents are Indian by heritage, but my parents were born in Kenya. We were born in Kenya. And those those kind of lines of hierarchy were really present you know, to be really crass, it was white, brown, black. And so those layers of hierarchy were entrenched within us. So even amongst black and brown people, we were having to figure out who was better, you know. And of course, that leads on to things like bleaching and wanting to be fairer. and, And we have that within our own community. So it's all very complex and there's so many layers to it. And I think what Tanika's work does is it starts peeling away layers of the onion in a very accessible way so we understand it and then we as ourselves can start to dig deeper and find out more information. It sounds like you have a very close working relationship with uh, with Tanika because uh, you have worked with her on uh, a few projects in the past as well, a few plays. So what, what how do you work together? It's, it's one of those um, gems, I guess. You know, I met Tanika when I, cause I used to be an actor and... Uh, so I met her uh, because I started working on her plays as an actor. And actually, I was in the original production of Great Expectations in 2011. And I played the character, our character of Krishna. And at the time, it was Mrs. Gargery. And when I started working with her then, for me as an actor, it was the first time I was doing work that was really unearthing our history, putting, giving a lens on it that gave us voice through the impact of what was happening to us and I'd never experienced it like that before it was historical it was political and she cleverly was integrating British society which is very much part of who we are as well (laughs) so I talk a lot I enjoy conversation as does Tanika and we just there was a synergy that happened both as friends and as artistic collaborators and when I moved into directing it was Tanika that um I called and was like you know I really want to start directing. And we started working on some readings together. And 
it's just grown really it's been quite an organic process I think in terms of our working relationship it's incredibly open it's incredibly collaborative I think there's a there's a mutual respect for the skills that we bring to the table you know she she's an extraordinary writer and she's got that skill set so so I mean we know how brilliant it is and you can see it from her body of work I I bring the skill set as a director to kind of pump life into those characters and make it three make it 3D if you like but I work from the text. Yeah. So I'm not a director that goes, oh, that's nice. And my concept for it is this. I'm not going to put it in a glass house with lots of nice lights set in the 1800s. That's not, uh, that's not how I work. Because I'm in new writing. I come from the text. So a lot of those conversations with her, me, our designer, Reza Maggiora, who we've also worked with a lot, they're exploratory. They're they're curious. They're questioning. We bring the ideas that it brings to us. We bounce it off each other, and she's very open. And actually, what she's looking to do is see how it, how it lives in the mouths of actors. We we hear it. We cut it. We talk about it with the actors. So the process is really it's really unified, I guess, because we are all accountable for what we're doing to bring it to life, and we all respect the skills that everyone brings to make that happen. There's, so that for me is a really lovely way to work. Um, so nobody's too precious about preserving their own ideas. No, not so far. Not in my experience today, actually. We've, we've been very, I mean, the good thing is with that kind of level of collaboration and, and, and sense of what you're doing, we absolutely know the things we have to stick by to. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so Tanika will be very clear and go, we're not cutting that or you need to do that. Or, And I'll be like, Tanika, it doesn't work if we don't do this because of this, this and this. So I'm really, I'm, I have to fight for that. And so it's very open and and we're able to say, you know, there's one thing being collegiate. There's another thing where we have to to know the things we need to hold on to to make it work. And we both, we, we seem to work quite well within that, that framework. You've worked on... Uh, a couple of plays with her before and broadly the same sorts of uh, subjects but I think the others were based more on real stories rather than fictional stories like Lions and Tigers at the Globe and The Empress which is still running at the RSC yes uh, why is uh, this an adaptation of Dickens rather than uh, taking an original story well I mean this is another great skill of Tanika is that she is a great adapter I mean her doll's house that she did that was on at the Lyric Hammersmith directed by Rachel Ryden was another beautiful adaptation which actually has been put on the curriculum um Dickens Dickens was one of her father's greatest authors uh, she loves Dickens as well and also he did write at the time of Empire yeah. and he was writing at the time where we were talking about the glory days of empire and, and queen victoria you know was become was uh, her whole image was being pumped around and statues were being put up all over the place for her to represent how brilliant this was so inevitably anything that he was writing about was greatly influenced by imperial strategy and the impact it had on society so i think there is a direct correlation in terms of the stories she likes to tell anyway but there's also something really important about these adaptations and actually putting it through a different lens because unfortunately in schools and what's on our curriculum, we still have a lot of work to do. And Tanika and myself are working with um, Bloomsbury and the Lit and Colour Festival, which is about getting more plays written by global majority writers onto the curriculum. The biggest problem we have, even if they sit on the curriculum, is that teachers don't want to teach them because they don't know the text. Yeah. So they're going to go for, you know, an inspector calls, which is one of the most popular texts. That if they see an emperor, the empress, you know, or that they're just going to pick an inspector calls because they've seen it more on stage, they understand it, the resource, blah, 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 all of that. And Great Expectations is a great, it's a love text. It's on the curriculum. It's there. People know it. If we can start going, here's an adaptation that your global majority students will understand the structure of the original text, put them both together, teach them together. We're going to start opening up that conversation without the fear of not knowing what it means coming into play. And I think that's a really brilliant thing, because we, if the more we have of these different lenses of the same stories, the more we understand that actually we're far more similar 
then we are different. The, 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 the story that impacts a Victorian British society can be transferred and translated into a 19th century Indian village life and have direct correlations to what Dickens wrote. And if we can understand that framework and open ourselves up to it, the conversations are far more interesting. We start to understand our, our diversity in our country. We start to be able to look at each other with far more empathy. We start to see how connected our histories are. So I think there's so many benefits to it. And also much like Shakespeare, I mean, we've got 37 plays of Shakespeare that keep getting readapted. What would happen if we didn't do adaptations? Yeah, yeah. You know, what would happen to the RSE and the Globe? And yet they're two of our biggest institutions based on a man who wrote 37 plays that so we keep adapting through different lenses because that that's a benefit of time that we've got with brilliant writing. So I think there are lots of, there are lots of really important things about having good adaptations. It gives us lived experiences through different lenses, but keep a structure of a story that feels familiar and and for want of better words, safe for some people, be that teachers or producers or, you know, but ultimately it's a piece of new writing. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. But yeah. one that's, uh, uh, it seems familiar as well. So you're sort of yeah. sneaking exactly. it in there in a sense, are you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so what's uh, what's the atmosphere like in the rehearsal room at the moment? You said you've got people from loads of different backgrounds. Does that make a difference to, to the rehearsals? Um, yes, I would imagine it does. I mean, by and large, I work with I work with quite a diverse cast most of the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been a really wonderful rehearsal room, to be honest. Really, really beautiful bunch of actors. Really highly skilled as well. Isha Ladi is playing our Pipley. And Giles Cooper is playing our Herbert Pocket. And these two men, they're in their 40s, but they're they're traversing the 10-year-old, you know, to 30-year-old landscape beautifully. So um, we've got Catherine Russell playing Miss Havisham. Andrew French is playing Mullick. And what Tanika's has done in this version is Mullick, who is a character of Magwitch from the original, is from the Sydney community. And the Sydney community are a community of Africans from the African diaspora who have moved from, majority of them, from, of them are from the Bantu tribe in East Africa. But from the seventh, eighth century, they've been moving to India and living in India. So through trade routes, through the slave trade route as well, they've been moving, moving and living there. So they speak language, they've adopted the culture, they are Indian and African. So... All of these kind of nuances with a very diverse cast brings up these conversations of which all of our experiences really feed in to the kind of um, political and racial conversations we're having. Yeah. And ultimately it makes us look, look at the construct of race and where it's come from, especially in a world where, oh my goodness, we are still in the race debate. It's, more, it's, it's being more fueled than it's ever been. And I, a part of me goes, is this is the wrong way around. Yes, yeah. You know, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be leaning into this construct as much as we are. And now now we're being polarized by gender identity and, and whatever this woke culture culture war is, which is really damaging, I think, because it's siloing us even further. And it's in a way, for me, it feels like it's boxing that conversation and holding on to that construct and going, we really must see our differences. So I think being in a room with so many different ages, cultures, experiences means that we kind of have to take accountability to share what we feel about those things instead of leaning into the suffering or the trauma. I mean, it's, of course, that's all there. This part yeah. of our history is part of human nature. So if we're looking at how we move forward, how do we hold that space and see ourselves as a global society instead of a South Asian society that needs to fight yeah. for this because Imperial has happened and our money was drained from India. I mean, it, it's it's really about stretching the nuance of looking at our history to see where we are now and understanding we are all, are all one, really. Yeah. yeah, and the times when culture has been at its richest, like in yeah. Renaissance London or in ancient Greece, or when lots of different societies clashed together in uh, in one space, aren't they? Yeah, uh, exactly. But you've got, uh, you mentioned Ish Aladi in the uh, the lead part there. That uh, I've seen him a couple of times 
in the region. He was um, in Hobson's Choice at the Royal Exchange four years ago, and he was yes. fantastic in that. And yeah. uh, last year he was at the Octagon in Bolton. He, he's a very versatile actor, isn't he? Yeah, he's absolutely brilliant. And I've worked with Isha lots. So I worked with him on Lions and Tigers. Yeah. And actually, I was meant to direct Hobson's Choice. So I had designed it, I'd cast it. I'd got it all ready, and I unfortunately got ill a, a week before oh, yes. uh, we started. So he, casting him in Hobson's Choice was such an obvious choice. I was <laughs> like, oh, my God. It's kind of, yeah, it's there for you. He's very fond of this theatre. He's Manchester. He lives here. He's got a great versatility, and he he's an incredible collaborator in the room. He's, he's highly intelligent as well, and he's incredibly instinctive. So he brings that to the table, he, he knows how to deal with the text and he knows how to collaborate with the director, you know. Um, so we open the space up for thought and thinking and we, we, we bat ideas off each other and and um, he is a magician. He's, he's going to be wonderful. I'm, and I'm really – we Tanika and I offered him the part. When I got the call asking me to direct this and Tanika and I talked about what we were going to do, the next phone call I made was to Ish. And that was last year. It was very early on. And said, "This is what we're doing, and we'd love you to do it." And thankfully for us, he said yes. So very happy. This is a co-production with Tamasha, and you're the artistic director, of course. You announced your uh, first full season as artistic director only last year. So, uh, can you just explain what Tamasha is and what uh, what its mission is as a company? Sure. I mean, Tamasha's been around for thirty five years actually, yeah. and it was. Uh, when it started, it was set up by two South Asian women, Christine London Smith and Sudha Butcher. And its aim was to put South Asian voices on the stage. And when they set it up, it was amazing because obviously it was much needed in the industry, but also they built relationships with companies and were putting our stories on kind of mid-scale stages, as well as running development programs for artists. And over time, like well, before Sid and Christine left, actually, they changed the remit to global majority. Because what they started to understand is that actually for a lot of South Asians, our lived experience isn't just from India. Like for me, my parents were born in Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> so my lived experience is East African. And my my kind of my ancestral heritage is Indian. So actually, I'm I'm Indian, I'm African, and I'm now British. So we can't, you know, a lot of it was about the, the fact that we need to encompass all of us as, as migrants, as colonial migrants, as people who have to travel around the world and assimilate in different places. And so it became a company that started to look at, started to look at the lived experience of global majority artists. And actually, it was about building a network and a critical mass of us in the industry and and opening the doors without siloing us as black, brown, East Asian. And that became the remit of the company. Over like the last kind of seven to 10 years, it's a company that's, and we've hit COVID, it was kind of leaning more into the kind of audio drama route. And so when I, when I got the opportunity to apply for the job, for me, one of the big things was really raising the profile of the company. And one of my biggest frustrations is, is that after 35 years, it is so critically underfunded and we are still on the fringes. And this is a problem I have with our sector that I go, why is it the companies from the global majority remain on the fringes with no money, whereas a company equivalent to my, the size that we've got now has got twice as much money and five times more opportunity? So I came in going, no more. We, we need to build a brand, get more money in, and actually raise the profile of the organization and put our voices on those mid-scale stages, as well as kind of exploring our digital program and looking at new writing. So that's kind of what's happened. And over the last two years, it's been really brilliant because the shows that I've been offered as a freelancer that resonate with the mission of our organization, I've been able to make into co-productions. And this is where one of them came out because this job was offered to me as a freelancer. But actually the, the story and what we're talking about, our colonial histories, our post-colonial histories, the lived experience of our global majority artists, these are all missions and values that, that Tamasha yeah. holds. So, and also because we work with these audiences and communities, we can bring that shared knowledge to organisations like the Manchester Royal Exchange. 
I mean, it's brilliant that Manchester are doing it, but, you know, there's a huge South Asian community. There's a huge global majority community in Manchester. And it's very rare that we see that work being put on our stages. And even here, stories from this lens is, is we haven't seen it often enough that Hobson's choice on our great expectations but there's still two adaptations you know so it's, it's so it's kind of building these co-productions means we can share knowledge and and have these conversations and have the difficult conversations about how we're programming and how we're seeing this work and also it allows a company like Tamasha to learn from a producing house like Manchester so yeah. there's a two-way thing and we can bring our our shared knowledge of global majority how we work with those artists, but also what people from the global majority experience from institutions that are, you know, pretty much white-led institutions. And that can be an uncomfortable conversation in some ways, but I think it's a really important one. It's not that it's bad or it's not that. It's that we, because we haven't interacted, the kind of culture of organisations can be from, from, from a very narrow lens so the more we work together and the more we all open those lenses up and start to integrate better. So for me, it's really important that, that we find these connections and we, we start to, yeah, we start to hold that space together and we start to kind of balance each other out as a very small company and a big producing house and go, they are real points of synergy that, that mean we make work that is really important for our, our communities and our audiences. Um, so it's been really it's been a really good partnership and I'm, and I'm very, I'm very glad that the exchange were open to it. You know, not everybody would be open to it, but they have been. So I feel, I, I feel really happy about that. Yeah. And you've recently announced a, a three year program funded by Paul Hamlin foundation on uh, diversifying dramaturgy. Can you just uh, explain a bit about that and what it means? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, one of the, the big things for me, like especially working with new writing, was seeing that a lot of our writers from the global majority were feeling quite boxed in maybe because they would write a play, they'd maybe come from a form that, that resonated with them. And whilst being through a development process, we'd be told, oh, yeah, could you just focus on those characters and could you just make it like, you know, ostensibly to be very crude and crass again, could you focus on two characters and make it a three-act play or make it a two-act play? Mm. Uh, could you have your peaks and troughs this way? And the symphony is such, and you need to end, you need to, to build to your peak to end it there. That all good notes, all good notes. But what it does is it makes someone panic because they're coming from a form that maybe doesn't have that structure, which means the character arcs and the way they're talking doesn't fit that formula. And then if you're writing for someone like the Royal Court, you're going to go, I, I want to get a play on at the Royal Court, so I'm just going to ditch my ideas and I'm going to really follow the expertise of that dramaturg and try and get that play on. Sometimes that works brilliantly because that's what it was about, but more often than not, it doesn't. And we recently at Tamasha worked with Mojasola Adebayo, who is one of my favourite writers and theatre makers that we've got. She's in, She's been around for so long I cannot, I don't understand why she is not saturating our stages because she is an extraordinary performer and an extraordinary writer. And she and her brother, Deborah Adebayo, came up with this concept for a digital, like a live DJ on stage, so like a concept album on stage, looking at Af- Afrofuturistic myth, looking at in- the intersex community, looking at where. It was, it's the myth of the Nomo tribe in, in Africa. And Modge wanted to put together this one-woman play with a DJ playing live on stage, um, playing music that was a concept album to the story she was telling. It, and that's what we put on last year. And it, it was, I was so proud of it because it, it spoke to why I'm doing this programme. If we don't have writers having the freedom to write like that and to bring us a global form of storytelling that integrates multimedia art form, that integrates ways of thinking, how do we move forward and give voice to those things? And as a global majority artist, I go, oh, God, I've got storytelling techniques from Africa, from India. You know, you know, if I think of someone like Rani Murthy, who is a Manchester-based performer, and she used to run Russell Theatre Company, She's from Singapore, Malaysia, India. She writes one-woman shows. She writes immersive shows. None of them have the structure 
from the Eurocentric model of playwriting, but it doesn't in any way take away the value of that work. So for me, this programme is really about opening that conversation, both in buildings and with our current dramaturgs. We also have very few dramaturgs of colour that are working uh, in buildings or in literary departments. So I kind of wanted to see how we can open that out or give even writers of colour the space to go, you have dramaturgical skill. Hmm. And so so let's nurture that. So let's give you a space to find your voice and get other companies understanding that you can serve that skill. I think as a sector as well, we are we're not supporting our new writing. It's being it's kind of being, I don't know, it's kind of being minimized. Literary departments are going, artistic leadership is going. So we you know, it's all of these little things that are kind of are going to have a long-term impact. But if we if we start kind of embedding the community with the possibilities of what they can do as writers or theatre makers, then I think we're, we've got a better chance. And that programme is also about embedding local communities with their civic spaces. So let alone the writing part of it, it really is about opening up the conversation of, of communities, whether they're audience members or whether they're potential theatre makers and be that technicians or marketing people or producers or actors, directors, you know. So it really is about, um, yeah, opening the heart to to what the community feel their artistic leaning is. And, and yeah, developing, developing all of that so that we can develop a, a kind of national dramaturgical programme and approach to new writing. That was Pooja Guy, Artistic Director of Tamasha, about Great Expectations, adapted by Tanika Gupta from the novel by Charles Dickens, which will run at the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester from the 8th of September to the 7th of October 2023. For more information, see www.royalexchange.co.uk. For more information about Tamasha, see www.tamasha.org.uk. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.